the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Mavis Cameron disappears. Mavis Cameron was one of thousands of American business girls, a filing clerk in the Fifth National Bank in Chicago. At 25, Mavis was rather pretty and had a pleasing singing voice. She also loved the spotlight. Naturally, she found bank work a little dull. Even that night when Mavis and four of the girls in the bank had dinner in the main dining room of the fashionable Park Wilson Hotel, it seemed a little dull until the after-dinner coffee was served. Then the MC of the floor show asked Mavis to sing a number, and she felt better. She felt still better following the outburst of applause at the conclusion of her number. So much better, she decided to drop into the Park Wilson's fashionable bar, make a phone call, and have a nightcap before going home. Scotch and soda, please. Mix it. Right. This ought to do it? I'm sure it will. Keep the change. Oh, thank you. Uh, give me the usual, Joe. Straight bourbon? What else? Hey, how's it covered? <laughs> On the nose. I, uh, just heard your song. You were terrific. Thank you. You know... With a voice like yours, you could be packing a in at a good nightclub. Oh, now I get it. You're a professional talent scout and want to get me into the movie. No. No, I'm Dan Spinelli, professional gambler. Does that shock you? Not in the least. Live and let live is my motto. And that's what I'm going to do right now. What do you mean by that? Live my life and let you live yours. Good night, Mr. Spinelli. Oh, just think... Tomorrow I can tell the girls at the office I met a real live gambler. You, uh, you could tell them a lot more than that. Yes? Uh, you've heard of Domingo's out beyond Lakeside? Of course. It's a private gambling club, isn't it? Oh, it's more than a gambling club. Swell dining room, swell floor, swell floor show. A lot of big people go out there, nightclub operators. People that count. So? So, I'm going out there right now. Why don't you come along, baby? Me? Huh. I'll introduce you to a lot of people who could push along that voice of yours. The producer of the floor show is a friend of mine. I'm not kidding, he really is. I'm afraid not, Mr. Spinelli. I've heard that one before. Uh, you're exactly like I figured you'd be. You office scouts, you're all alike. You're a bunch of dreamers. You talk a lot about the swell careers you could have with the right break. And when you do get a chance to meet some of the right people, what do you do? What do you do? You run home, scared to death. Now, oh, just a minute, Mr. Spinelli. Oh, I'm not blaming you. Well, why shouldn't you go home? At home, you can listen to the radio, eat candy, have a terrific time. And if you go to Domingo's with me, you can't tell what might happen. You might have to even meet a couple of show producers. So you just play it safe, baby. It may be dull at home, but you'll always get to work on time. Well, is that all you have to say? Yeah, that's all. Very nice. Wait a minute. Yeah? 
Uh, could we be back fairly early? <laughs> sure. We'll leave any time you say. Well, what are we waiting for, Mr. Starmaker? Spinelli used just the right approach, didn't he, Mavis? You know you're being a fool. At this time, you've gone too far. But as the hours pass, you tell yourself your fears are groundless. Dan treats you with perfect courtesy. And you're surprised at the number of prosperous-looking people he seems to know. You help him lose several hundred dollars, then proceed to the rendezvous room and enjoy the floor show. Afterwards, you dance. Suddenly, you've had enough. Dan. Uh, Dan, would you mind if we sat the rest of this out? Oh, sure not. What's the matter, kid? You tired? Awfully tired. And I have to get up pretty early. Well, I always try to make a lady happy. But here we are. Go on, take the load off your feet. I'll order another drink. Oh, I don't think I want another drink. Do you mind if we leave now? Uh, sure, sure. I'll, I'll just finish this. When will we be on our way, huh? Say, what stuck a pin in you? Music? Yes. That song. Uh, another guy? Another guy. My fiancé. He used to whistle it all the time. Every time I hear it, it gets me a little. Oh, what happened to him? He's still overseas. Pilot? Doctor. Dr. Clint Rogers, M.D. Ah. He's been gone so long, you're, uh... You're getting a little lonesome, huh? I've been lonesome ever since he left. And do you know something? I've decided I don't want a career anymore. I just want to marry Clint. Well, too bad. We could have had a lot of fun, baby. Shall we go? Was it just the song, Mavis? Or was it that uneasy feeling you have about Dan that made you want to leave so suddenly? It must have been the song. Or as you're ready to leave the club grounds, Dan is still the considerate escort. Ah, here we are. Come on, hop in. You've really got yourself a car, mister. <laughs> like it? Mm-hmm. You, uh, want to take the wheel? Oh, I'd love to. Well, go uh, ahead. You sure you don't mind? <laughs> Why should I? We'll probably be safer, too. <laughs> As you speed Dan's convertible toward the city limits in your tiny apartment, you're glad your reckless little adventure is nearing its end. Everything's been fine so far, but you can't throw off a feeling of uneasiness. For several miles, Dan says little, seems preoccupied, and you feel relieved when he breaks his rather strange silence. Oh, uh, Mavis, you don't happen to have a couple of aspirin with you, do you? All of a sudden, I've, uh... Uh, I got a terrific headache. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I haven't any. Believe it or not, I've never had a headache in my life. You're lucky. Say, uh, would you mind stopping for a minute at that sandwich shop up ahead? Maybe I can get some aspirin there. Well, I doubt it, but we'll give it a try. Say, my battery's down, so just keep the motor running while I'm gone, will you? This will only take a few seconds anyway. Well, it's your car. Dan! Get going! Oh. Dan, you shot someone! I said get going and get going fast. There's a gun in your ribs, baby. You just saw what happened to one guy that crossed me. the prologue of Mavis Cameron Disappears. The Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. Recognize that? June is busting out all over. Yes, spring's arriving fast. Which means that if you want to put spring into your driving and rid your car of winter stiffness and squeaks, it's time now to see your friendly neighborhood signal gasoline dealer for a spring changeover. 
he'll drain out winter-worn oil and refill with Signal Premium, the new type Signal motor oil that actually keeps motors six times cleaner and reduces cylinder wear one-third. He'll drain the transmission and differential and refill with fresh summer weight lubricant. He'll give your whole car a signal double-check lubrication with nine specialized signal oils and greases. And what's more, he'll be glad to check other items that need attention every five or 10,000 miles, such as air cleaner, oil filter, or front wheel bearings. Yes, this is just the spring tonic your car needs. So make it a point this week to drive into your signal dealers for a signal spring changeover. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Mavis. Your stupid little adventure, starting with a pickup in a cocktail lounge, didn't end the way you thought it would, did it? You didn't expect to be an involuntary accomplice in a hold-up and shooting, did you? For a few seconds, you're so dazed with shock you act like an automaton. Your handling of the car is instinctive, and finally, you find words. Is he dead? He is, unless he got a plastic heart. Are you... Oh, why was I such a fool? Shut up. Turn right at the next corner. This car's been tailing us for the last five minutes. I'm glad. I hope it's a prowl car. It'll save me the trouble of phoning the police. Uh, good. He didn't turn. Baby, you shouldn't have said what you did about phoning the cops. This is a pretty dark street, baby. It's after midnight. You would have a fatal accident. Not a soul in this whole world would know about that sandwich shop job except me. Oh, Dan, you... You wouldn't. Better pull over and park. We got a couple of things to talk over. Oh. Pull over, I said. Ah, oh, baby. Oh, please, Dan. Don't kill me. I, I know you can do it easy. But I swear I'll never tell about tonight. That's the way you feel now. An hour from now, you'll feel different. No, I won't. I swear I won't. I'm making a deal with you, Dan. Don't you see? I... I'm trading you my word for my life. I'll keep it, Dan. I, I swear I will. You don't have to kill me. Kill you? <laughs> what, what makes you think I want to kill you? A gorgeous dish like you? Oh, no. No, I, I was thinking about marrying you, baby. You see, the law don't let wives testify against their husband. <laughs> When Dan leaves and you finally reach your apartment, your senses are reeling, your brain is spinning. You hear Dan's final words over and over again. I'll pick you up at 10 in the morning. Remember, you waited for me and drove the getaway car. That makes you guilty too, baby. <laughs> Now you're beginning to see what you're up against, aren't you, Mavis? Of course, what Dan told you about wives not being permitted to testify against husbands isn't true. Not when the action occurs before marriage. But you don't know that, do you? And it wouldn't help much if you did. You do know Dan is a murderer and wouldn't hesitate to kill you if he thought it necessary. What you should do is phone the police. But... You've made a pact with a murderer, haven't you? Yes. It saved your life. And you think you must keep it. You try to snatch a little sleep, but sleep is impossible. Finally, at six o'clock, the morning paper is shoved under your apartment door. The headlines sicken you. Sandwich shop owner killed in holdup. The subheadings are even worse. Unidentified man and woman. Seen fleeing from the scene of the crime in open car. <laughs> There it is, Mavis. It seems hopeless, doesn't it? Even if you call the police, you know your story would sound phony. You were seen with Dan at Domingo's just before the crime by scores of people. He introduced you to several as his best girlfriend. You can hear the district attorney now pounding at you with questions. Which will damn... You were friendly with Benelli, were you not? 
And you were at the wheel of Spinelli's car when you drove him from the crime, weren't you? And you realize how foolish your answers will sound in a courtroom. I, he, he told me he had a headache. And he thought maybe the sandwich shop man might have some aspirin tablets. <laughs> There's no way to turn, is there, Mavis? But frightened as you are, you're sure of two things. You'll never marry Dan, and you'll never allow your absent fiancé, Dr. Clint Rogers, to be remotely involved in your difficulty. It seems there's only one thing to do. Leave town, disappear, until things clear up. You've only three hours. It's seven o'clock now, and Dan's due at ten. Not much time, but you're in a tough spot and you quickly throw a few belongings into an overnight bag. At nine o'clock, you're at the bank, where you make a hurried explanation of your unexpected departure and withdraw your savings. At ten, you're on an eastbound plane. Six months later, you're featured singer at the Ten of Spades, a prosperous little night spot in Brooklyn, under the name of Doris Trent. Uh, that voice came in handy, didn't it, Mabel? I'd like to recommend a look in the night when Nicaragua, what a wonderful spot. The coffee and bananas and the temperature high. So take a trip and on a ship for sailing away across the agua to Managua, Nicaragua, ole. You went over bigger than ever tonight, didn't you? And Vern Wilson, the London musical comedy producer, and his secretary watched you closely. A few months in London would be a great help. You're pretty sure he was there just to catch your act. You're confident when you reach your dressing room. But as the minutes pass, you begin to wonder. Well, Mavis, nothing to worry about after all. This seems to be your lucky night. Come in. Well, 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 well. Long time no see, Miss Trent. Uh, Doris Trent, I think the billing said. Well, well, now that you've found me, what's on your mind? That note to the police, written just after you left, telling all about that sandwich shop job. Gave the exact time, my name, the license number, my car, gave everything. You're the only one to do all that, baby. It wasn't me, Dan. Maybe not. But I'll just... Never feel safe until we're married. And this time, I'm not taking any chances. We're going up to Connecticut tonight. Ten minutes, Doris. Thanks, Ernie. I, uh, I've got to go on now, Dan. Let's talk this over in the morning. I said tonight. Ah, go ahead. Go ahead, do your show. Only, baby, if you got any ideas about double-crossing me and calling them cops, you drove the getaway car, Remember? In case anything serious happens to me, there's a written confession in my pocket telling exactly how you helped me pull a job. Ah. Go ahead. Go ahead, I'll wait for you here. You start down the hallway toward the powder room off stage. You finally realize what a fool you've been, what a coward. But you're not going to keep on being a fool, are you, Mavis? Not with that wall telephone just five steps ahead of you. Operator. Get me police headquarters. Quick. Just a moment, please. Hello? Police headquarters. Better hang up quick, baby, and I mean quick. I had a hunch you'd try to double-cross me. I figured I'd better keep my eye on you till the show was over. You should have looked around. Now, I know for sure who wrote that note to the police. I told you I didn't write that note. You just tried to call the cops. So all of a sudden, I've lost interest in my wedding. We'll just go for a little ride instead. Come on, baby. Start walking. No, Dan, I'm not going. If I have to get shot, I'll take it right here. Let go my arm. Come here. What's going on here? Something wrong, Doris? This yes. punk bothering Why, you? Why, you... He, uh, he is. He, he wants to date me. Tell him to leave, will you, Eddie? Maybe I'd better take him into the office and call the cops. You see Dan's hand tighten on the gun in his pocket. Be careful how you answer, Mavis. You can't let the club manager get hurt. 
He's been swell to you ever since the day you walked into the tennis spade. Oh, no, thanks, Eddie. There's no need for that. He's just another wolf. Tell him to leave. That's good enough. You heard what the lady said, Bub. Start traveling. Okay, Pop. Anything you say. I'll see the lady later. Even the police can't help you much right now, can they, Mavis? They've been after Dan for months, and he's still on the loose. And you're sure he's going to kill you on sight. A minute ago, you thought you were all through running. Now you must make another hasty exit. And this time, you're ready. You've always known Dan might show up, and you've kept most of your street clothes in the tennis spades wardrobe room, your money in the club safe. With Eddie's help, you're out of the club in 20 minutes. An hour later, you're on a train. Some weeks later, under a new name, Lily Gray, you're a top favorite with the customers at the Hacienda, a little night spot just south of the border. But after five long months, you hate it, don't you, Mavis? The Hacienda's little more than a honky-tonk. And you hate yourself for your past stupidity. You hate your new name, Lily Gray. And most of all, you despise the proprietor, Spanish Joe, and his crude greed for money. And now he approaches the table where you sit alone with a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Hey, Lily, there's a nice American gentleman just came in. He wants to buy for you some champagne. Not now, Joe. I'm eating a sandwich. Please, Lily, let him sit with you and treat him nice. Let him spend his money. Okay, Joe. I'll let him spend his money on champagne. But if he gets any ideas... He won't get ideas. Here he comes. Oh, come, Mr. Fontaine. Sit down. Miss Gray, she likes champagne. Sure you don't mind, Miss Gray? When you're going to buy champagne? Of course not. Sit down. Thank you. Cigarette? No, thanks. Well, it's been a long chase. But I finally caught up with you, didn't I? Mavis Cameron. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But now a word to you drivers. If you want the tops in performance from your car, you naturally want gasoline that's tops in quality. And to be sure you're getting the tops in quality, there are just two things you need to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go farther gasoline. Yep, that's all. For gasoline quality and gasoline mileage go hand in hand. You see, you get those quick signal starts, that fast signal pickup and smooth knock-free signal power, because signal gasoline helps your motor run more efficiently. And naturally, the more efficiently your motor runs, the more mileage you get. So the very same features in gasoline that give you extra driving pleasure also give you extra mileage. That's why Signal says, to be sure you're choosing the gasoline that's tops in quality, there are just two things you need to remember. One, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Mavis, after all your attempts to lose your identity, after all you've taken at the Hacienda, a man you've never seen sits at your table and calls you Mavis Cameron. He's a detective, of course. It's all quite clear, isn't it? Dan Spinelli was captured and involved you as his accomplice. And now this man plans to take you back to Chicago to face a nasty trial with a card stacked against you for a crime committed by another. And you're not going to be returned as a fugitive from justice if you can help it. Not after what you've been through. You've only one card left, Mavis. It's, um, funny you should call me Mavis Cameron. I was just thinking about her tonight before you came in. We used to work together in the same floor show. The customers used to mistake us for each other, too. Yeah, I'll bet they did. I'm Detective Sergeant James Fontaine, Chicago Department of Police. 
You know why I'm here. We're leaving in the morning, Miss Cameron. Like the billing says, the name is Lily Gray. My papers say the same thing. As I was saying, I knew Mavis Cameron intimately. I'd like to tell you about her. I think it might help you solve your case. Sure, sure, go ahead. If it'll make you feel any better. The more you tell now, the less you'll have to tell later. There's not much to tell, really. Mavis Cameron was just a good kid that got a bad break. In love with one guy and scared to death of another. A hoodlum named Dan Spinelli. Go on. This is getting interesting. She went a little silly one night and let him pick her up in a cocktail bar. And they went night clubbing. On the way home, Spinelli tried to stick up a sandwich shop and kill the proprietor. Mavis drove the getaway car with a gun in her ribs. Okay. So the guy was a little rough. If she was innocent, why didn't she go to the police right afterward? Before they got home, Spinelli decided to kill her, too. She swore if he'd let her go, she'd keep quiet. And she did. That wasn't very smart. No, it wasn't. If she was innocent, why did she take a powder? Oh, didn't I tell you? Uh, Spinelli had another great idea, too. Since a wife can't testify against her husband, he gave her the choice of marrying him or else. You know, you talk a pretty fair game. Is that all you have to tell me? That's all. Cigarette? Thanks. Light? Thanks again, Miss Gray. Did you say Miss Gray? You said you were Lily Gray, didn't you? Yes, I did. You're a nice guy, Mr. Fontaine. Uh, I hope your girlfriend comes back to Chicago and clears things up sometime. I, uh, I think she will. Sometime. Like I said, she was in love with a guy. Well, this is a pretty long trip for nothing, you might say. Just one more bum steer. But I'm glad it happened. I always figured Spinelli's confession was phony. Confession? Yeah, he had it all written out, big as life. Is, uh, is Spinelli in jail? Spinelli's dead. The Brooklyn police closed in on him one night about five months ago. He tried to shoot his way out. The department boy shot straighter. Five months ago? In Brooklyn? Yeah, that's right. A woman called the police one night from a little nightclub, the Ten of Spades. When they answered, she hung up. So naturally, the Brooklyn boys decided to investigate. One of them spotted Spinelli in a car across the street. The funny thing about it was... they never did find out who put in that call to the police. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure. Drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Isabel Jewell and Tony Barrett. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Edward Bloodworth, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.